Now that we've become familiar with some prehistoric images that show animals, now we're going to move to some, some that show people. So now it is the Tlatilco female figurine. Remember how when we were talking about Lascaux, we said it was really, really rare ever to see a human figure painted on those walls? Well, that's not the case if we're talking about Paleolithic sculpture, where it's not unusual to see the human form. However, when we see them, they are almost always figures of women. Let's take a look at these. These um, are three examples. One comes from Spain, one comes from Russia, one comes from Austria. And um, um, even though these are from widely disparate geographic regions, it's really, really clear that certain commonalities exist among them. So please press pause and write down what you see as some of those common features. What are those things which are emphasized and what are those things which are de-emphasized? We can see that the faces, the hands, the feet have all been de-emphasized as not being very important. Instead, what is being emphasized are those things that Paleolithic culture most admired and respected about women. So let's think about what it was that made women so incredibly important during prehistoric period. Um, what we're talking about is mainly small bands of people who were largely nomadic. The infant mortality rate must have been sky high. And so the ability of a woman to be able to become pregnant, to, 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 to have life grow within her, and then to, to give a, a, give birth to a baby and then and then once that life is there to be able to sustain that life by providing it food from her own body these must have just seemed like incredible capabilities that men simply did not have and so let's look now and and let's talk about those things which are emphasized they all have to do with fertility, with abundance. And so the large breasts, the ability to breastfeed, the abundance of food, the, the, the large bellies and the, the, the wide hips and the, and the large thighs all suggest figures, females that have enough body fat to be able to conceive and, and carry a pregnancy to term and to give a live birth and then to sustain that life. Now, images like this, we, we believe, were probably used in abundance rites or fertility rituals um, involving certainly human uh, fertility, but perhaps even relating to the fertility uh, of the soil, the earth itself, and maybe even of, of animals also. So let's move now to talk about the one that is in our image set, the Tlatilco female figure. And I'd like you to push pause again, and I'd like you to talk about the things that this shares with the, uh, the woman of Willendorf over here on the left, as well as those things which are a little bit different. Write those down for me, please. So while there's a whole lot more attention to facial features, um, there are still some similarities. We, we don't have the big belly and the big bodacious tatas. However, we still have the de-emphasis on hands and feet as well as the large thighs and the amount of body fat that would have been necessary for, uh, for childbirth. Now, I want to move us next to introduce you to a skill that you are going to be developing all throughout the year. And this is the skill that we call attribution. And this is a skill that is going to appear on the AP exam. Now here's what I mean by attribution. Think about when you hear a new song by your favorite singer. And you've never heard that song, but you instantly can attribute it to that singer because of similarities between the way that it sounds and other songs by that artist. 
Well, okay, so the same thing is the skill that you're going to be learning in art history, where you see works that come from a particular artist or a particular culture, works that you've never seen before, but you can instantly identify them as from that artist or from that culture because of their similarities with works that you're already familiar with. So let's practice that for a minute with a whole bunch of Tlatilco female figurines. So hit pause for me and please talk about how would you know that all of these are from Tlatilco. Hit pause and do that for me please. We can attribute these to Tlatilco culture because they're all made from clay. They are all basically the same size. They would all fit in the palm of your hand, about three inches or so. Some are a little bit less than that, but they're all quite small. They all have the big hips and thighs, smaller breasts. They have more of, a, of an hourglass shape center or middle. Um, the de-emphasized hands and feet, and then faces with very similar stylized facial features with that pinched nose as well as those the eyes with this almond kind of shape and these protruding eyebrows as well as quite elaborate hairstyles. So what do we know about these Tlatilco figurines and where they come from and what they might have meant to the people who made them? Um, they come from um, an area in Mexico City that's only a few miles away from where the sacrum in the head of a canine was found, even though that work was from some 10 or 15,000 years earlier. Um, these were discovered in the 20th century by clay miners who were digging in this neighborhood uh, for clay and they started digging up these doll-like forms, these doll-like figures like you see these like right here. And so ultimately anthropologists came in or archaeologists came in and, and started studying the area and excavated what they realized were homes of the Tlatilco people. Now, the Tlatilco practiced something that I think is absolutely fascinating, and that is that they buried their dead loved ones under the floors of their houses. Now, at first that seems a little odd to us because it's so foreign from our own experience, but if we can just kind of wrap our heads around that for a minute, it's actually kind of cool because they're your loved ones. You love them, and so you've got them right there with you. You can think about their closeness to you. You're there, and you can protect them and their remains, and, and their spirits are there and, and can protect you. And so in the graves under the houses, they not only found the bones of the, of the, of the um, loved ones, they also found that that, um, that these figurines had been put into the graves along with some other kinds of grave goods including masks and pots and even musical instruments. So what that causes us, what that leads us to ask is what might these things have represented? Well, there are a couple of theories. One thing that we know about that is very, very common among, um, among indigenous American peoples um, is a common belief, a common, uh, a common belief in duality. Now, what we mean by duality is, is this ability to be able to recognize opposites and to be able to hold them in existence at the same time. So to be able to acknowledge, for example, that yes, we are here in the right here in the right now in the physical world, in the world of the flesh, but at the same time, there is another realm, the realm of the spirit that we can't see. And that even though we can't see it, we know it's there and that it, it coexists with the realm of the living. This dual sort of phenomenon, this dual existence, 
Also part of this notion of duality is the connection between the opposites of life and death. And the, the, the awareness among these peoples, and we see this especially true among cultures within Mesoamerica, is this belief that you cannot have one of those without the other. You cannot have life without death, and you cannot have death without life. And so perhaps what this figure represents is a manifestation of that belief in duality, that ability to acknowledge opposites, that ability to see into the land, the realm of the living at the same time that you can see into the realm of the dead, that ability to, to see into the realm of the flesh at the same time that you can perceive the realm of the spirit. So that's one theory as to what this might represent. But another thing that comes to mind that many have talked about is that it is a, um, it is a common belief among some indigenous American peoples that babies that are born with some sort of genetic difference um, are thought of as having a special connection with the gods a special relationship with the gods, we might say. They, 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 they are born frequently, they do not live very long, they come as, as a gift from the gods for a brief period, and they die and they go back to be with the gods again. And so we see representations of those, for example, among the Olmec, who very frequently created these images of, of infants that were born with Down syndrome. So knowing that there is this respect, this, this, um, this, um, this sense of awe for these babies that are born with genetic differences and the, and the belief in this connection with the gods, it's also very tempting to think that perhaps what the Tlatil co-figures, and, and among the several hundred that were found, there were a few dozen that represented a female figure with a double face. Now, sometimes it's a single body with two heads. Sometimes, like the one that we have here, it's a single head with two faces. And so is it at all possible that there might have been one of those extremely rare cases where you had conjoined twins where, the, um, where there was a single head and two faces or a single body and two heads. If, if so, then that notion of such genetic differences indicating a closeness with the gods combined with this ability to recognize and see dual oppositions must have made this a powerful image indeed for the people of the Tlatilco. Now, one more thing that we can talk about is how were these figures made? So um, let's go to and let's look at another example of these. Um, this one is from the, um, the Art Institute of Chicago there. And this one is a teeny tiny one, but you can see some others that are in this case uh, with this teeny tiny one that also has the, the double face on the single head. Um, um, the way that these Tlatilco figurines were made is they were all made from clay. They were shaped by hand. Um, some of them seem to be more elaborately formed than others, um, but all of them have the large thighs. All of them have, or the, at least the vast majority of them, have the narrower waist. Um, and um, so once these were formed by hand, once we get up to the face, then the facial features, such as the nose, would have been pinched with the fingers. The eyebrow ridges would have been pinched with the fingers. Then a sharp tool would have been used to incise the mouth and the eyes. And then where the hair is, they would have used a comb-like tool in order to put in those patterns. Now, I just 
love this work, and I think it's really, really fascinating. So I hope you like it, too.